name's Lee. I'm from Sumter, South Carolina. I'm a citizen. Um, why is the EPA claiming that six greenhouse gases emitted from jet planes are a threat to human health under the Clean Air Act while doing nothing to address ongoing lawsuits over leaded aviation gasoline or the real health concerns of stakeholders worldwide? Cancer causing heavy metals and fuels and their additives <clears throat> and aviation induced cloudiness. You, the EPA, claim the authority to regulate aviation emissions under the Clean Air Act, a law that should protect us from the aforementioned poisonous pollution. However, the definition of pollution is being perverted to mean climate change gases in what can only be called a violation of the spirit of the law. Air pollution which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. That's the quote. As you can see by the wording in the Clean Air Act, lead, barium, aluminum, and trade secret toxic chemicals clearly present a greater danger to public health than greenhouse gases, no matter how much climate science you accumulate. Furthermore, material safety data sheets of aviation fuel and their additives almost always contain the same warning, do not dump in water. Yet, raw fuel dumping or burning these chemicals, dangerous chemicals and then dumping them in water is somehow safe. Finally, despite great efforts to find bioaccumulation or biomagnification studies on precipitated aviation pollutants, none seem to exist. The EPA and Obama administration are ignoring the global outrage over the most visible climate change concern from airplanes, cloud creation. Do a search for the word chemtrails on the internet and you will see millions of concerned citizens who look up and wonder what in the world are they spraying. Despite what you may think of the myriad of maladies attributed to these clouds, the global outrage is nonetheless clear. They are right to be worried and we should all be concerned. The EPA's claim that CO2 is a greater threat to human health than contrails and aviation-induced cloudiness is based on incomplete IPCC data that downplays the effects of contrails on our climate. The IPCC's fourth, fourth assessment of contrail radiative forcing only accounted for linear contrails meaning any contrail that spreads out and turns into cirrus clouds was not accounted for. How significant is this heat-trapping contrail conundrum? Quote, contrails formed by aircraft can evolve into cirrus clouds indistinguishable from those formed naturally. These spreading contrails may be causing more climate warming today than all the carbon dioxide emitted by aircraft since the start of aviation. Another researcher stated, a single aircraft operating in conditions favorable for persistent contrail formation appears to exert a contrail-induced radiative forcing some 5,000 times greater than the estimates of the average persistent contrail radiative forcing from the entire civil aviation fleet. Although this research has now been incorporated into the IPCC computer models and revised down, in my opinion, these claims highlight gaping holes in climate science. As of 2013, quote, aerosol cloud interactions are, the, are one of the main uncertainties in climate research. Scientific understanding of how contrails transition into cirrus clouds is severely lacking but rapidly evolving with the latest research showing that cirrus clouds are filled with metal aerosols from human sources. Quote, the big one we found is lead, coming from things like tetraethyl lead and fuels, still used today in light aviation. So that's probably the biggest metal that we find, or the most frequent metal that we find. But we find a whole host of different metals, actually. Apparently, small amounts of metal particulates have major effects on cirrus clouds. Quote, it would seem that you would have to change all of the aerosol in the atmosphere very radically to get a big difference on big effect on the clouds, but because mineral dust and metallic particles are such a small amount of the particulate matter, just a percent or two, it means that you only have to change about a percent or two of the particles to get a big effect on these clouds. The latest research casts doubts on the IPCC's contrail assumptions and requires serious consideration when addressing the real climate change impact of aviation. High altitude metals and cirrus cloud condensation nuclei are likely coming from leaded avgas and jet exhaust. 
contrails or making cirrus clouds and small changes in atmospheric metal have large impacts on cirrus cloud creation. Cirrus clouds trap heat and are likely to have a greater impact, climate change impact than CO2. Finally, aviation-induced cloudiness endangers future growth in solar energy, affects tourism and spending, and is projected to make terrestrial astronomy impossible by 2050. Geoengineering scientists, NASA, NOAA, FAA, USDA, DOE, and international corporate partners are discussing the use of biofuels and sulfur-doped jet fuels for contrail control. This cirrus and cirrus cloud seeding with bismuth, bismuth triiodide to melt these clouds away. The EPA should be directly involved in these discussions. As a result of these recent filings, I findings, I strongly encourage the EPA to consider expanding the scope of this endangerment to include metal particulates and cloud formation from jet exhaust. If the EPA complies with the spirit of the Clean Air Act, they will protect us from metal aerosols attributed to Alzheimer's, autism, cancer, and a plethora of other debilitating illnesses. If the EPA is truly concerned about aviation-induced climate change, they will regulate the production of contrails and cirrus clouds, which change our climate to a much greater extent than the sum of the six greenhouse gases named in this proposal. Regulating heavy metals and aviation-induced cloudiness will be meaningless without proper verification. Even though ICAO members sign a binding agreement to only use certain chemicals in their gas tanks, we all know agreements and regulations are useless without proper verification. Therefore, I request mandatory, random testing of jet exhaust be immediately implemented. This is the most important step the EPA can, can take to law, do its due diligence to protect us from harmful pollution and get real world data to improve future regulations. Most of the data behind this endangerment finding comes from research in highly controlled environments where vari most variables are known. We need verification of non-ideal situations where fuel fouling, fame contamination, or improper maintenance end in vastly different exhaust particulates than seen in lab settings. To achieve verification, I propose that the EPA randomly attach a trailing probe to both foreign and domestic flights, then collect and analyze the results to determine real-world exhaust constituents. Alternatively, ground-based LIDAR observations may be possible over fixed high-traffic areas and prevent possible terrorist attacks using aerosols. Either way you choose, we need verification and protection. In conclusion, the EPA should expand this endangerment to include metal aerosols and cloud creation, create a verification system that includes all aircraft, protects us from aviation pollution, holds violators accountable, and commits to better scientific accuracy for future determinations. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of so many who could not be here. Um, and thank you for listening to a, a layperson's views um, on this subject. While I appreciate the efforts of the Center for Biological Diversity, the Sierra Group, and the Friends of the Earth to get the EPA to hold the aviation industry accountable, the poor people like myself have to live near these airports, under these fuel dumps, and under these clouded skies. I hope that some faith can be restored in our EPA by your action here and now. Tell the ICO, ICAO that they will meet your demands and our demands, not the other way around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you for all of your comments. Um, second panel. Next one. Yes, thank you all. Uh, my name is Michael Saraceno. I'm a citizen. While greenhouse gas emissions from aviation may be only 2 to 2.5 uh, percent, um, the global aviation CO2 emission is, almost equals the amount of CO2 put out by the country of Germany. Others have talked about how CO2 uh, is trapped in the atmosphere and causes warming of the earth, so I will leave um, more of that to them. But the fact is that the more CO2 that is uh, put into the atmosphere, that results in more combustion. And the, I think one of the biggest concerns with more combustion from aviation and the uh, sure increase in aviation, the FAA forecasts 
that um, aviation will grow 2% uh, per year, um, reaching a billion passengers by 2029. And the issue with more combustion, not only is more CO2, but the FAA Modernization Act, FAA Modernization Act that was recently passed in 2012, essentially is allowing the FAA, through position-based navigation, to um, save, yes, they do save fuel on descent because they're not doing step-down, but what they're not telling you is the FAA is allowing the airlines to crop dust USA Okay, and the reason why how they're doing this is through uh, uh, next gen or, or, or precision based navigation. They're allowing the um, airlines to pack in more planes in tighter formation at much lower altitudes. And we know from NASA that aircraft operations below th 3,000 feet decrease ground level air quality. Okay, and that's NASA saying that, and I'm, I'm submitting my. Uh, testimony into the docket as well with all the references so you can feel free to look them up yourself. So we have all around this country the FAA allowing, right, they changed the highways in the sky across USA and they have not found one environmental impact. That's it. You can change the highway over the entire continental US and there's not one environmental impact that that will impose on any, anyone or any person. That is absolutely ridiculous. But the most important issue, the reason why this needs to be uh, investigated further, is that the more combustion that we have, the more landings and takes off, takeoffs year over year impacts the people who live downwind from airports across the United States. Now, what's the difference, right, from living downwind from a highway, from living downwind to the airport? But can certainly, both of those situations will give you downwind pollution. And the difference is, is that highways have noise barriers or pollution barriers, and NOAA has done studies on this, that those sound barriers with vegetation prevent highway pollution from floating downwind into communities, okay? Where is the... Uh, barriers to downwind pollution from aviation, and most of that is through approaches. I've listed several studies that have done uh, he uh, London Heathrow, um, uh, LaGuardia, all, a bunch of different studies that have shown um, that, uh, in fact, uh, airport particulates can reach uh, as far as five to six, um, in some cases, ten nautical miles downwind from an airport. Okay, and so the biggest issue with that is, is that we know that vaccines do not cause autism, okay? The largest organization in February 2012 came out and said that vaccines do not cause autism. And why did they say that? Because every scientific journal that was published on that refuted that. And, and, and in fact, it proved the opposite of that. We now have 12 peer-reviewed studies, and I've cited in my references, that there's an increased risk of autism associated with increased uh, air pollution around conception and or pregnancy. The vast majority, and I talked to Harvard scientists uh, through personal communication, is not genetic. It's environmentally induced pollution. And the environmentally induced pollution is what is causing autism. And we will see a spike in autism across the USA, and I don't care they can change the diagnosis or hide the incidents, but the fact of the matter is more children are receiving services today than they were, and they will continue to receive more services over the next 10 years. There is a heavy metal load in autism. We know that. That's why vaccines were pointed at. The heavy load, heavy metal load in vaccine, I mean, um, in air pollution, can in fact deposit in the hair and nails of these children. And in fact, when they do look back at the hair and nails of these children, they find that the heavy metal de deposition in the hair and nails is significantly higher than typically developing children. So we know they're being exposed to toxic metals, and that's from environmental pollution. UC Davis 2012 just came out with a, a new study that said the 2015 cost of autism-related um, expenses are $268 billion, and by the year 2025, it could be anywhere between 500 to a trillion dollars in related costs. We know that aviation emissions have trace heavy metals. They have uh, the byproduct is NOx. It is uh, sulfur. High the aviation 
Uh, jet fuel contains 100 times more sulfur, more sulfur than diesel trucks. And we're to, we can talk about awesome, but also high air pollution areas also decrease IQ of children. And the very interesting thing about that is that even when these children hit six, seven years old, they still did not catch up to their peers. So this damage that's being caused by low IQ, by pollution induced, and it does have an effect uh, on one of the most important things that I will tell you. If you want to know how dangerous air pollution is, you just have to look at the trans, transgenerational epigenetic changes. So there was a study done in, uh, that I have in the reference by, uh, let's see here, where is it, by uh, Tracy in 2013. And so what they did is they exposed mice to jet fuel. And what they found is that it didn't change the gene, but it changed the way the gene was expressed. And that change in the way the gene is expressed for obesity got into the genome and was passed on to subsequent generations. Okay, and so this is why I care. Because my nieces and nephews, my children, or could potentially marry somebody else's kids who are in a heavily polluted environment, and that change in the genome gets into the June pool. So your grandchildren and great-grandchildren could in fact develop transgenerational epigenetic changes through environmental pollution. And another way besides greenhouse gases, and I'll keep this brief, there is evidence to show that persistent contrails do in fact warm the earth. They trap incoming solar radiation and they block outgoing uh, uh, infrared radiation. And so there were studies done by NASA and what they found is after 9-11 attacks, there was a one degree Celsius spike between the maximum highs and the maximum lows in terms of temperature. So they looked at skies without contrails after 9-11 because the planes were grounded for three days and they found a spike in uh, uh, the temperature range. So in fact, contrails do change the climate. And I'll just end with uh, another uh, NASA scientist uh, also talked about contrails, and he's using data from, I think, the 1990s to 2000s, early 2000s. So this is old data, but what he says is that increase in surface and lower atmosphere's temperatures uh, by 0.36 or 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. So that's what he's saying. The contribution to contrails uh, could be to warming. 0.36 to 0.54% uh, Fahrenheit per decade. And I think that proves that contrails do in fact temp affect temperature. And the other thing you should know about contrail, persistent contrails, um, is we have more combustion, more jet aircraft, more airplanes, you're going to get more contrails and you're going to get more warming. So it's this whole vicious cycle. And the thing about contrails is that they produce clouds that morph into cirrus, okay? When they study contrail uh, spreading, they only study within the first few hours. They do not study the whole life of that artificial cloud that's produced. And that artificial cloud that is produced would not have formed if there would not have been a contrail in that area. So these, these clouds that are being induced uh, are producing clouds that would not naturally be there. That changes the hydrological cycle, which is rain. And the other thing that you should know is that these, the way it could change the rain is that when, these, when the engine at high altitude uh, freezes the ice crystals in the atmosphere, it is actually changing the uh, vapor content in the atmosphere. Okay, so that vapor content we'll have a change on regional uh, climate change. And I thank you uh, very much for having this open hearing. Good morning, my name is Amanda Bays and I live in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. For the past five years, I have documented aircraft emitting trails across the sky. I have taken hundreds of videos and thousands of photographs of these persisting emissions. Many of the aircraft I have witnessed appear to be spraying something into the atmosphere. Uneasy with my observations, I wanted to know exactly what was causing the aircraft to leave, leave visible trails that did not dissipate. I reached out to local, state, and federal government agencies for information and assistance. What I experienced was disillusioning, to say the least. When I called the EPA, I was told that the FAA handled aircraft emissions 
When I called the FAA, they call, told me to call the EPA. I was shuttled from office to office with no agency ever accepting responsibility or accountability. My calls were not returned, nor were my concerns ever addressed. The sage advice I finally received from, an EPA, from the EPA was to hire a plane and do my own testing. This was especially disheartening since I had been led to believe that the Environmental Protection Agency was the ultimate protector of the environment. Additionally, the EPA advised me to contact the Department of Environmental Quality for the state of Virginia. Not surprisingly, the DEQ informed me that they do not regulate mobile sources of emissions, don't go to airports, and don't check what is being loaded on planes. As for my request for my yard to be tested for heavy metal, chemical, or biological contamination, I was told that the Virginia DEQ could not use state money to test for those materials. Furthermore, my complaint was in an area that they had no authority to investigate, another dead end. I reported Naval, Station, Naval Air Station Oceana military jets for dumping fuel over my neighborhood and spoke with at least 30 individuals at the base. I finally spoke with Terry Chamberlain, head of the environmental office at Oceana. Mr. Chamberlain bluntly informed me that the military regulates itself. Needless to say, they continue to dump unburnt fuel over the residents living close to the base. For several years, I electronically reported on airplane pollution using the Environmental Violations Form on EPA's website, epa.gov tips. It was referred to me by an ASRC federal contractor working for the EPA. I have always included my contact information on the tip report and identified specific aircraft that can easily be traced. No one from the EPA has investigated any of my formally filed complaints. Since I became interested in the possible dangers of chemical spraying in the environment, I have contacted the Virginia Pollution Control Board, National Weather Service, Oceana and Damneck military bases, NOAA, NASA, the Department of Defense, Brookhaven National Laboratory, the Department of Energy, the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the Health Department, the Department of Travel, countless federal agents and operators, the Virginia Beach Police Department, and even the White House, all to no avail. To date, no one from any agency has investigated my complaints. I was told to talk to my local representatives. Every agency I contacted responded to my reports by telling me that I was seeing condensation from en engine exhaust. Aircraft engines do emit water vapor, of course, but vapor that quickly dissipates. What I was witnessing was persistent and long-lasting. How can anyone reasonably conclude that a particular aircraft emission is merely a contrail without testing it? That is both unscientific and irresponsible. Chemtrails, as opposed to contrails, is the term used to describe persistent aircraft emissions. There is a rising international concern about the existence of airborne chemical spraying bolstered by a growing body of scientific evidence. What is in the air that we are breathing? One chemtrail activist from California decided to have, excuse me, decided to have his hair tested for heavy metals at his own expense. High levels of strontium and barium were uncovered. I have a copy of his lab results that he voluntarily sent to me. I will post this document on my Facebook page, Madison Star Moon, following this hearing. Did this contamination come from chemical spraying? How can we know if local, state, and federal agencies refuse to take ownership of the issue to provide testing and usable data and ultimately regulate when required? The whole burden of investigation cannot rest with the EPA. It must be shared with other agencies in Congress. However, there must be clear lines of authority so that the public is fully informed and protected. The stated purpose of this hearing is to consider the full range of pollution generated by aircraft. The desire for investigation into chemical spraying has become a worldwide phenomenon. We are counting on you as the protectors of the environment to act. No more runarounds for citizens deeply concerned about the health of the world and the individuals that inhabit it. Thank you. My name is Patrick Roddy. I'm a San Francisco-based anti-geoengineering activist and researcher, and I run uh, StopSprayingUs-SF.com. Um, 
Today's hearing is supposed to address whether greenhouse gas emissions from aircraft endanger public health. But when you mention greenhouse gas, most people think of carbon dioxide, a harmless trace gas essential, essential to all life on Earth. But CO2 represents just 3% of the planet's greenhouse gas. 95% of it is water. Even preschoolers know overcast skies make the nights warmer and the days cooler. Clouds insulate, trapping heat, and reduce the temperature range of the night's lows to the day's highs. Which brings me to persistent contrails. Uh, all but the willfully ignorant uh, know our skies have changed dramatically over the last few decades. Uh, the dark blue skies of our childhood have been replaced with a milky white haze, crisscrossed with fast expanding persistent contrails, stretching from horizon to horizon and spreading out to cover the sky. These trails can stretch for thousands of miles and can be seen by anyone visiting nasa.gov. These trails persist regardless of altitude, temperature, humidity, or other atmospheric conditions. Persistent contrails used to be rare, but have now become an everyday phenomenon all over the world. If physics hasn't changed, what has? So what makes these trails form, persist for hours, and stretch thousands of miles? Which condensation nuclei are they forming on, and are these harmful to human health? Geoengineers propose spraying tens of millions of tons of reflective particles into the atmosphere in an attempt to reflect sunlight back into space and thereby reduce global warming. This is known as solar radiation management, stratospheric aerosol injection, or albedo modification. This process, patented by defense contractor Raytheon, is quite simple. Tiny particles sprayed from jets would act as condensation nuclei, attracting atmospheric water vapor to form persistent artificially nucleated contrails, which would then spread out and form artificial cloud cover, artificial cirrus cloud cover. When geoengineers discuss radi solar radiation management in public, the only substances they say they'd consider spraying are sulfates or sulfuric acid. However, their own literature concludes that sulfates have limited effectiveness and that highly toxic nanoparticles of aluminum and barium should be used instead. And when confronted, they doggedly refuse to address the human health impact of their proposals. Other geoengineers are more candid about their plans to poison the sky. Stanford's Ken Caldera admitted in an interview in 2006 that he discussed putting pathogens in clouds to wage chemical and germ warfare on civilian populations when he worked at a government weapons lab. It's no surprise that the public doubts these scientists have their best interests at heart. Last month, I brought uh, this paper to the Paris Climate Conference uh, addressing the uh, human health impacts of proposed geoengineering solutions. I formally request it be entered into the record. Uh, it documents the dramatic increase in Alzheimer's and respiratory failure since the 1990s when persistent contrails became commonplace around the world. I conclude that these persistent contrails are, in fact, artificially nucleated with the same toxic particulate metals outlined in Raytheon's patent, and that a solar radiation management program has been deployed since at least the 1990s. Weather modification research is nothing new. The earliest patent dates back to 1920. Uh, Raytheon's patent proposes reducing global warming by injecting aluminum, thorium, and other metallic oxides in the 10 to 100 micron range into the stratosphere using jet exhaust. The U.S. Navy patented another delivery method which forms artificially nucleated contrails from metal oxides with a 0.3 micron particle size. Other methods include airships, rockets, chimneys, and slurry pipes. The best known proponent of solar radiation management is Dr. David Keith. He told the 2010 annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science that aluminum oxide has four times the volumetric radiative forcing uh, for small particles, as does sulfur, and 16 times less the coagulation rate. Sulfur particles stick together and quickly fall out of the stratosphere and are much less effective per unit mass. He also said a nanofabrication study proved it was very simple to spray high-quality alumina particles from a plane by injecting alumina vapor into the exhaust. His 2010 paper, Photophoretic Levitation of Engineered Aerosols for Geoengineering, proposes spraying 50 nanometer thick disks of aluminum, barium, titanium, instead of sulfates. Pope et al. also concluded aluminum nanoparticles are much more effective than sulfates in a 2010 perspective in nature climate change. The material safety data sheet for nanoparticulate aluminum, uh, 
uh, states it's an irritant to the respiratory system, is implicated in Alzheimer's disease, can cause pulmonary disease, tumors, neoplasms, and, sh and should not be released into the environment without proper governmental permits. Alzheimer's disease rose to the sixth leading cause of death in the United States uh, from the eighth between 1999 and 2013. In 1994, it didn't even make the top 10. Now people in their 20s are showing signs of Alzheimer's. Research shows that aluminum accumulates in the brain, bones, and kidneys, is a neurotoxin, accelerates brain aging, increases oxidative stress and inflammation of the brain, and is seven times more bioavailable when inhaled than when ingested orally. Barium is much deadlier. According to its material safety data sheet, exposure to barium salts can cause pulmonary arrest, vomiting, diarrhea, convulsive tremors, muscular paralysis, shock, convulsions, and sudden cardiac failure. Barium targets the cardiovascular, nervous, gastrointestinal, hematology, respiratory, reproductive, and renal systems, as well as the adrenal glands and liver. It is also an irritant to the skin and should not be released into the environment. In 2011, respiratory failure overtook stroke to become the third leading cause of death in the United States. At a time when smoking was at an all-time low, emission standards on vehicles and power plants were at their strictest, and heavy industry had relocated to China. Hundreds of scientific papers thoroughly prove the toxicity of both aluminum and barium. It would take days to cover a fraction of the proof. According to EPA, particulate pollution can cause early death from heart attacks, stroke, congestive heart failure, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It also causes asthma and inflammation of lung tissue and may cause cancer, reproductive and development, developmental harm. Particulate pollution can lower life expectancy by one to three years. Water and ice have refractive indices of 1.333 and 1.309 respectively and produce rainbows with an angular radius of 42 degrees centered on the antisolar point. But in recent years, a formerly rare phenomenon has become commonplace, a 21 degree halo completely encircling the sun. Some argue that these halos, or incredibly rare sun dogs, are formed by ice crystals, but nothing can change the refractive index of water and ice, which forms 42 degree halos. Metal salts have a higher refractive index and therefore form much tighter halos. Uh, crystalline aluminum oxide, uh, for example, has a refractive index of 1.762 to 1.778, while barium sulfate has a refractive index of 1.636. My contention that these incredibly rare sun dogs are in fact formed by metal salts with a higher refractive index than water is reinforced by rainwater analysis taken during a 30-day period when I recorded 21 of these halos in uh, March, April 2015. I collected rainwater in clean glass bowls on the roof of my San Francisco apartment building on April 5th, 6,000 miles downwind from the nearest factory, power plant, refinery, freeway, quarry, or mine. I sent it to a NELAP certified lab, and they recorded barium at a staggering 160 micrograms per liter. Less than one gram will kill an adult human. An earlier test of rainwater collected in January 14 recorded aluminum at 190 micrograms per liter. I submit both these uh, rainwater tests the, for the record. San Francisco's air should be pristine. We get prevailing winds off the Pacific Ocean. Why is it less left to concerned citizens to pay for our own rainwater analysis? And why did, the, why did EPA stop publishing data on airborne aluminum back in 2002? Let me take this opportunity to formally submit a freedom of information request for EPA to release the historical results of all metal tests in our air and rainwater from the 1980s to present. I have recorded hundreds of time-lapse videos showing the progression of these persistent contrails since 2011. Thousands of others worldwide have also documented the alarming increase of these persistent contrails. Uh, oh, sorry. This directed. Thousands of others worldwide have also documented the alarming increase of these persistent contrails and been met with deafening silence from supposedly green organizations like Greenpeace, who, who are a proud member of the, in the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative and all governmental uh, agencies, including EPA. Your mandate is to protect the environment, especially the air we breathe. I wouldn't expect you to admit the existence of a program as covert as the Manhattan Project, even one blatantly obvious to an increasingly aware and outraged populace. But when a geoengineering program is causing millions of premature's death a year, you must do more than pass the buck back and forth between other three-letter agencies. Do your job. History will judge you on your actions or inaction.
Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organisers for making this hearing possible, to thank the other contributors, and a very big thank you to those that have helped with the vital funding to make my trip possible. My name is Max Bliss. I am no scientist. In fact, I'm a general builder who has worked outside all my life. After moving to the southwest of France in 2009 to a region famed for high sunshine hours and big blue skies, I became increasingly aware of the incredible increase in contrails and associated cloud cover. I began to notice this daily and this greatly troubled me. I started to photograph and film the sky now for four years. Barely a day goes by without seeing various contrails, some thick, spreading, but most alarming is watching spurts within contrails. Some uh, watching and then watching the sky blotted out. Subsequently, I wanted to learn more and became an avid researcher and a passionate environmentalist. I have attended and participated in various high-level climate change and climate engineering conferences. With respect to this hearing on the proposed finding of greenhouse gases from aircraft cause or contribute to air pollution that may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health and welfare, the major component, 95%, of greenhouse gas is water vapour, together with other constituents from exhaust or ejected particulate matter from aircraft form contrails, contrail cirrus, haziness, and cloud blankets, which eventually which certainly do affect changes to the weather, altering rainfall, altering temperatures, inducing droughts, reducing frosts, etc., and ultimately affecting climate change. When the planes were grounded following 9-11 and later in the UK in 2010, there were obviously no contrails. The sky cleared of clouds and natural clear blue sky returned, confirming aviation is affecting cloud cover. According to various investigations, such as the 1998 subsonic contrail and clouds effects special study, they have noted that apart from water and CO2, there are metal particles including zinc, aluminium and titanium, also soot, sulfates, etc., found in the exhaust blooms contributing as, nu as nuclei for ice crystals to form contrails. A 2010 study for, Wright, for the Wright-Patterson Air Force Research Laboratory entitled Nano-Sized Aluminium Altered Immune Function opens the abstract of this sentence. On the basis of their uses in jet fuels, munitions, and the most likely scenario for aluminium nanoparticle exposure is inhalation. The UK Civil Aviation Authority responded to the concerns of fume incidents. The 2004 investigation into cabin air quality found that the peak particulate matter found in the air ducts was aluminium. Although the study does hypothesize that this may be from the heated lu engine lubricating oils contaminating the air supply via the air bleed valve, it is worthy to note that 50% of the cabin air comes from the atmosphere and as planes often fly through contrails or the aerosols left by other planes, I feel investigation into the presence of nanoparticles in the troposphere from planes, although very difficult, must be initiated as soon as possible. Many hundreds of pilots and frequent flyers report debilitating illnesses linked to cabin air. Please refer to aerotoxic syndrome. There are many new studies emerging on the links with aluminium and Alzheimer's dementia and various other ser serious ailments in humans, animals, whales, fish, and even bees. Plants, trees, and all life is affected by aluminium toxicity. Recently, the media has announced that one in three seniors will die with Alzheimer's. It just becomes clearer with research that nanoparticles may already be in jet fuels and are certainly planned for implementation in the near future and also, for that matter, in biodiesel. Aluminium oxide not only has potential negative health impacts, it is also known to contribute to making clouds as it is used in tracer rockets for NASA. Aluminium oxide has been suggested by geoengineers for solar radiation management, but is known to damage the ozone. Aluminium is acacian and is mentioned in weather modification patents, although there are hundreds of weather modification patents using various methods and ingredients. In a 1956 US patent, 2756097, for weather control, the author states, we have discovered that quantities of very dry superheated water vapor will disturb the thermal and electrical balances of cloud formation, causing dissipation or precipitation. We accomplished this.
process of our invention by injecting water or water solutions of ionic salts into heated exhaust gases of a power plant such as internal combustion engine, jet engine and the like. Through investigation into the huge disturbing increases in contrails associated cow covers and changes to the weather, one will be left wondering if this indeed is intentional or deliberate as the extra contrails and cloud generation is excessive in correlation with the increase in growing aviation use. I have taken pictures of nozzles in line with the engines on pylons. These are described as oil drain masks, but some patents of similar nozzles state other material can be evacuated from them. Even if oil was leaked out into the hot exhaust plume, smoke would be generated and smoke is used for cloud seeding for weather modification. A 1970 paper by Wallace B. McRae on the possibility of weather modification by aircraft contrails, he describes how the ice crystals formed in contrails effectively can seed cloud decks below as ice crystals survive falling to lower cloud deck altitudes, increasing cloud cover as effectively as dry ice cloud seeding. McRae writes, possible consequences of this are considerable. In fact, it seems probable that one of the projects for modifying the global climate discussed by Fletcher in 1965, namely modification of cloud cover over the North Polar Basin by cloud seeding, is already underway. Up until the mid-1970s, documents suggest the establishment desire was to intentionally melt the Arctic sea ice, to free up shipping lanes, access rich resources, and open up vast regions of ice-locked land, and adversely, climate changes could likely be blamed on the anthropogenic global warming to instigate the beginning of global governance through United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development Program to create the new world order. Interestingly, when one begins to research the history of weather and climate modification, it is surprising how far up the power structure the desire for developing a large-scale weather and climate modification program was, from presidents Eisenhower, JFK, Johnson, onwards and onwards, with a high priority put on these possibilities. The Johnson administration was using weather modification for geopolitical leverage with India and Pakistan in 1967. Would we be naive to think that the interest just went away because of the NMOD treaty? Look up owning the weather 2025. In conclusion, pollutants from aircraft that need prohibitions such as sulfates or the use of any nanny particles that which can travel via the air from a source of combustion into life organisms is causing serious negative health impacts to many forms of life. This needs to be tightly regulated and ultimately stopped. The notion that the climate science is settled is often repeated over and over by interested stakeholders such as those looking for lucrative funding in the burgeoning climate change arena, be it academics, politicians or entrepreneurs looking for success or to get rich, or more darkly, hoping to implement a one world government system. Climate has always had natural variability and weather extremes. However, these days, some weather extremes can be stimulated with technology. It is, appropriate, is it appropriate to reassess the anthropogenic global warming theory and replace it with climate change is man-made by using covert weather and climate modification technology known as geoengineering for geopolitical ends? We do not need to be scientists to observe the sky and see the obvious negative effects aviation is having and research the spiraling health impacts. Just start looking up and wake up. We do not consent to the use of weather and climate modification or the despotic new world order. God bless and peace for all.